Frodo Baggins is one of the most complex characters in The Lord of the Rings, but he is also one of the least appreciated by the audience. Why is Frodo not celebrated as much as Sam or other heroes in the story? Many criticize him for his treatment of Sam and, more importantly, for his ultimate failure. At Mount Doom, Frodo succumbs to the power of the ring and fails to destroy it. The situation is resolved for the best, but not because of him. It is necessary for Gollum to rip off the ring and, dancing like a fool, stumbles and ends up with all his underpants in the magma. But is it fair to say that Frodo failed? In this video we explore this question by using Tolkien's letter to find out what the author himself thought. To understand Frodo's behavior, we must remember a key figure in the story. The ring. It is not just an object, but a corrupting force capable of creeping into the mind of its bearer, accentuating the negative and weakening the will. Gandalf and Galadriel even refused to touch it, knowing that they too would be corrupted by it. To expect Frodo to resist its power after carrying it for a year is an unfair demand. Tolkien writes in letter 191. If you reread all the passages dealing with Frodo and the Ring, I think you will see that not only was it quite impossible for him to surrender the Ring in act or will, especially at its point of maximum power, but that this failure was adumbrated from far back. He and the cause were saved by mercy, by the supreme value and efficacy of pity and forgiveness of injury. No, Frodo failed. It is possible that once the ring was destroyed he had little recollection of the last scene, but one must face the fact. The power of evil in the world is not finally resistible by incarnate creatures, however good. Anyone who possesses power would be driven to action only to see his power backfire on him, as it happened to Isildur. Anyone who was selfish would be ensnared like Gollum. Frodo is in a perfect position. He is not too powerful, in fact he is weaker than the ordinary man, and he is humble. The ring has no way of controlling his mind, it struggles to corrupt his soul. At the same time, however, Frodo is brave and resourceful enough not to get stuck and to push himself into action for the good of Middle-earth. Tolkien writes in The Fellowship of the Ring, The Shadow of the Past, I feel very small and very uprooted, and, well, desperate. The enemy is so strong and terrible. And in the Fellowship of the Ring, the Council of Elrond, at least for a while, said Elrond, the road must be trod, but it will be very hard, and neither strength nor wisdom will carry us far upon it. This quest may be attempted by the weak, with as much hope as the strong. Yet such is oft the curse of deeds that move the wheel of this world. Small hands do them because they must, while the eyes of the great are elsewhere. But no one is truly immune to the power of the ring, and as a time pressed, as Sauron's power grows, and as they approach Mordor, even Frodo begins to feel the influence of the artifact. When Sam suggests that he share the burden, Frodo reacts angrily, thinking that his friend is trying to rob him. This is not a character flaw, but the effect of the ring's corrosive power. Tolkien illustrates Frodo's internal tension very well in the Fellowship of the Ring, the breaking of the Fellowship. He heard himself crying out, Never! Never! Or was it, Verily I come, I come to you? He could not tell. Then, as a flash from some other point of power, there came to his mind another thought. Take it off! Take it off! Fool, take it off! Take off the ring! The two powers strove in him. For a moment, perfectly balanced between their piercing points, he righted, tormented. Suddenly, he was aware of himself again. Frodo. Neither the voice nor the eye. Free to choose and with one remaining instant in which to do so, he took the ring off his finger. Tolkien also illustrates well Frodo's suffering and afflictions in The Return of the King, Mount Doom. Do you remember that bit of rabbit, Mr. Frodo? He said. 
and our place under the warm bank in Captain Sparamir's country, the day I saw an elephant. No, I'm afraid not, Sam, said Frodo. At least, I know that such things happen, but I cannot see them. No taste of food, no feel of water, no sound of wind, no memory of tree or grass or flowers, no image of moon or stars are left in me. I am naked in the dark, Sam, and there is no veil between me and the wheel of fire. I begin to see it, even with my waking eyes, and all else fades. At the climax of his quest, Frodo fails to throw the ring into the fire. He declares himself defeated and claims the ring for himself. I have come, he said. But I do not choose now to do what I came to do. I will not do this deed. The ring is mine. And suddenly, as he set it on his finger, he vanished from Sam's sight. The choice of words at this point is crucial. I do not choose now to do what I came to do it is not to be understood as Frodo choosing not to complete his task, but rather that he does not longer choose. He is no longer the master of his own will. The ring has taken over and governs his action. The ring chooses, not Frodo. It takes the intervention of Gollum, who takes the ring from him by beating off his finger and then stumbling into the lava to resolve the matter. This may seem like an anticlimactic ending, a fluke, a perhaps too obvious intervention by the author forcing his hand on the story. It is actually connected to one of the main themes of The Lord of the Rings. Pity. From the beginning, Gandalf teaches Frodo the importance of showing pity to Gollum. The scene in the Mines of Moria is prophetic, as Gandalf predicts that Gollum will play a key role. What a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed his end. Pity and mercy, not to strike without need. And he has been well rewarded, Frodo. Be sure that he took so little heart from the evil and escaped it in the end because he began his own ownership of the ring so, with pity. I'm sorry, said Frodo, but I'm frightened and I do not feel any pity for Gollum. You have not seen him, Gandalf broke in. No, and I don't want to, said Frodo. I can't understand you. Do you mean to say that you and the elves have let him live on after all those horrible deeds? Now at any rate he is bad as an orc, and just an enemy. He deserves that. Deserves it? I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment. For even the very wise cannot see all ends. I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies. But there is a chance of it, and he is bound up with the fate of the ring. My heart tells me that he has some part to play yet, for good or ill, before the end. And when that comes, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many, yours not least. Pity blends with the other themes of the story, faith, hope, compassion. Gandalf is wise enough to admit that he does not know everything that he cannot foresee every possibility, that there are forces at work beyond the understanding of the wisest. The only thing we can decide is what to do with the time we are given. And when the chances comes, when Frodo meets Gollum on the Emimuil, he will say, now that I see him, I pity him. And it is only because of Bilbo's pity and then Frodo's pity that Gollum will make it to Mount Doom alive. Gollum is beyond any chance of salvation at this point, but still pity prevails, and even Sam, who has always hated him, never trusted him, and tragically saw no chance of redemption for him, stops his end. Don't kill us, he wept. Don't hurt us with nasty cruel steel. Let us live. Yes, live just a little longer. Lost, lost, we're lost. 
And when precious goes, I will die, yes, dying to the dust. He clawed up the ashes of the path with his long, fleshless fingers. Dust. He hissed. Sam's hand wavered. His mind was hot with wrath and the memory of evil. It would be just to slay this treacherous, murderous creature, just and many times deserved, and also it seemed the only safe thing to do. But deep in his heart there was something that restrained him. He could not strike this thing laying in the dust, forlorn, ruinous, utterly wretched. He himself, though only for a little while, had borne the ring and now dimly he guessed the agony of Gollum's shriveled mind and body, enslaved to that ring, unable to find peace or relief ever in life again. We never see Frodo winning a battle or even defeating the forces of evil, rather we see him suffering, tortured, defeated. He is not the classic hero we have come to expect. But even if we stumble, even if we fall and fail, as long as we remain true to our good intentions and treat others with kindness and mercy, the rest will somehow work out as if by divine providence. Reflecting on the solution after it was arrived at, as a mere event, I feel that it is central to the whole theory of true nobility and heroism that is presented. Frodo indeed failed as a hero, as conceived by simple minds. He did not endure to the end, he gave in, ratted. I do not say simple minds with contempt, they often see with clarity the simple truth and the absolute ideal to which effort must be directed, even if it is unattainable. This weakness, however, is twofold. They do not perceive the complexity of any given situation in time in which an absolute ideal is enemished. They tend to forget the strange element in the world that we call pity or mercy, which is also an absolute requirement in moral judgment, since it is present in the divine nature. So Frodo did not complete his task, he eventually succumbed to the power of the ring. But even though Gollum is the one who threw himself and the ring into Mount Doom, it is precisely because of the mercy shown first by Bilbo, then by Frodo, then finally by Sam, that Gollum was able to fulfill his role. Frodo could have killed Gollum, but instead he showed pity. He did not throw the ring into the flames, but Gollum did it for him. And this was only possible because of Frodo's actions. Gandalf certainly foresaw this. Of course he did not mean to say that one must be merciful, for it may prove useful later. It would not be mercy or pity which are only truly present when contrary to prudence. Not ours to plan. But we are assured that we must be ourselves extravagantly generous, if we are to hope for the extravagant generosity which the slightest ease of or escape from the consequences of our own follies and errors represents. And that mercy does sometimes occur in this life. Frodo deserved all honor because he spent every drop of his power of will and body and that was just sufficient to bring him to the destined point, and no further. Few others, possibly no others of his time, would have got so far. The other power then took over, the writer of the story, by which I do not mean myself, the one ever-present person who is never absent and never named. Frodo went farther than anyone else could have, but in the end, defeat is inevitable for everyone. No one could have willingly given up the ring. Its power over the mouth of Mount Doom is such that there is no way to resist it. Surely it is a more significant and real event than a mere fairy story ending in which the hero is indomitable. It is possible for the good, even the saintly, to be subjected to a power of evil which is too great for them to overcome in themselves. In this case the cause, not the hero, was triumphant, because by the exercise of pity, mercy and forgiveness of injury, a situation was produced in which all was redressed 
and disaster averted. Frodo's suffering does not end with the destruction of the Ring. He eventually leaves Middle-earth, unable to find peace. His words to Sam are some of the most moving in the book. Do not be too sad, Sam. You cannot be always torn in two. You will have to be one and whole for many years. You have so much to enjoy and to be and to do. But, said Sam, and tears started in his eyes, I thought you were going to enjoy the Shire, too. For years and years, after all you have done. So I thought too once. But I have been too deeply hurt, Sam. I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved. But not for me. It must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger. Someone has to give them up, lose them, so that others may keep them. Frodo sacrifices his own peace so that others may live in peace. This is perhaps the highest form of heroism, not victory on the battlefield, but the act of losing oneself for the sake of others. Frodo undertook his quest out of love, to save the world he knew from disaster at his own expense, if he could, and also in complete humility, acknowledging that he was wholly inadequate to the task. His real contract was only to do what he could, to try to find a way, and to go as far on the road as his strength of mind and body allowed. He did that. I do not myself see that the breaking of his mind and his will under demonic pressure after torment was any more a moral failure than the breaking of his body would have been, say, by being strangled by Gollum or crushed by a falling rock. Did Frodo fail in the end? If we look at the literal task, yes, but if we look at the bigger picture, Frodo's real success was in making victory possible through his pity and humility. We are finite creatures, with absolute limitations upon the powers of our soul-body structure in either action or endurance. Moral failure can only be asserted, I think, when a man's effort or endurance falls short of his limits and the blame decreases as that limit is closer approached. I do not think that Frodo's was a moral failure. At the least moment, the pressure of the ring would reach its maximum, after long possession, months of increasing torment, and when starved and exhausted. Frodo has done what he could, and spent himself completely, as an instrument of providence, and had produced a situation in which the object of his quest could be achieved. His humility, with which he began, and his sufferings were justly rewarded by the highest honor, and his exercise of patience and mercy toward Gollum gained him mercy. His failure was redressed. Thank you for following me here. Whenever you agree with Tolkien's worldview, pity and divine providence or not, it has been fascinating to delve into the themes of the Lord of the Rings, and I hope that taking a look at his letters has fascinated you as much as it has fascinated me. Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you want to know how the story would have gone if Sam had seen the possibility of Gollum's redemption and they had befriended each other, or if Gandalf had taken the ring, Tolkien thought about these possibilities and left traces of them in the letters. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out those videos, and if you are watching from the future, you can find them right here. I thank my patrons for their support, I hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to delving deeper into Tolkien's worlds and thoughts, I hope you would uh, accompany me in this voyage. As always, I wish you good reading and a good writing. Bye!